What advice do you have for aspiring YouTubers that are starting from ground one? Expect to suck at the beginning. But Alan wasn't Alan either at the beginning. You know, Alan sucked at the start. Go watch episode one. Episode one is supposed to suck. Don't take that as you suck as a human. Like that's the problem is we make something, it sucks. We watch ourselves back on camera. It's like, oh my gosh, I was so bad. I can't believe it was that bad. No, like make another video, another video, and another video. It took me 350 videos until I wasn't completely embarrassed by my stuff. Like, I couldn't watch it back. And 700 videos until I inspired myself, where I watched the videos. Like, you know what? Like, I'm, I might be getting good at this thing, huh? 700 videos in. Most people can get there a lot faster than it took me to get down that path. And we just have these unrealistic internal expectations for how good we should be. So expect to suck and then just go create and keep making content. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because I need them for me, because I want to wake up every day and watch a video that puts me in a mindset to believe in myself more and go off and accomplish amazing things and attack the day. And I hope that this video does that for you as well. Okay, so today let's learn from one of the best, my husband, Evan Carmichael, and our take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Rule number two, invest in yourself. I think one of the biggest mistakes I made early on when I, when I had any money was I just tried to invest it and put it into the stock market. And I remember like I had 2,000 bucks. Like, okay, I'm gonna put it in the stock market and it's gonna grow. It's like, oh, it's like taking so long to grow. It's only 2,000 bucks. Where Jeremy actually made a much smarter call. Like mm -hmm. I think at the beginning, you invest in your skills and you invest in your network because that $2,500 investment that Jeremy made now has a mid six figure or high six figure business every year because he came to that event. But it's if you just income. put it into the stock market, sure it would grow. Yeah. But I think at the beginning, you need to invest in yourself to get the skills that you need to be able to then create the network and create value for other people. Yeah. And, and when entrepreneurs, any entrepreneur here watching, you're thinking about starting your business, the easiest way to start making money is to provide a high value business or service to people who have money to pay you. Mm -hmm. And so getting into YouTube consulting is great because there's not a ton of people into it, yeah. right? It hasn't been around for 40 years. If you're gonna get into tax accounting, that's a great business to be into, but you have to have years of experience to know what you're doing, right? I did, um, I did an interview with Tom mm -hmm. on his channel. Like, that guy's an expert, yeah. he's a genius. He's a genius. So if you're gonna go and compete with Tom, it's gonna take you so many years to even catch up to base mm -hmm. level of knowledge. But in YouTube consulting, it's easier because there is nobody really who's been doing this for 40 years, right? Or you're a chat GPT consultant mm -hmm. and you're helping use AI for people in the corporate, who is the expert on that? Like there's nobody because it's yeah. still so brand new. So this is the area where it's super high value for clients but there aren't a lot of experts at it. So for you to spend six months becoming great at it, you could be now in the top 1% of all people who know how to use that thing and then start charging for your services on top mm -hmm. of it. Rule number three, discover your core value. What is the importance of video influencers watching, maybe thinking about focusing their branding and their messaging? Yeah, I think if you're a human being, you have a core value. There's something inside of you that is the most important value in the world, something that you place higher than money. And when you figure out what that is, and then you bring that, not just to your business, but to your life, the people you hang out with, but in the context of creating a YouTube channel, the content, like how do you stand out? If you are another family vlogger, another gamer, another entrepreneur, and there's tons of competition, how do you do it? It's based off of what is the single most important core value that you want people to feel. Because I want people to feel an emotion when they watch my videos, when they watch these interviews, I want you to feel an emotion and not just get content. Got it. So your one word is believe, right? It is. What's the story behind that? How'd you come up with that? Uh, it came from my parents. They always taught me that I was, an, I was Evan Castrilli Carmichael and I could do anything that I wanted. And it's a message I still pass on to my son. And they just made me feel like whatever I wanted to do, it was possible and to believe in myself to do it. And it's, it's come through my entire life. My favorite movie is Seabiscuit. It's about this horse that is too small and a jockey that's too big and a owner that had no money and they come together as this underdog story and so anything around believe just I feel better about now translate that to a YouTube world when I had my channel I saw my channel but like my first video that took off that did well was this video it took me a year to get to 100,000 views on it and I was like I was so happy 100,000 views for a lot of you watching it maybe more than what you have right now I was so pumped 
I made a video around believe, which was my one word, and we hit 100,000 views in a month. And that video now has over 2 million views. And now believe oozes out of everything that I create. So I'm trying to give you the content that you can use to grow your business. But I want you to feel out of every piece of content that you can go off and do whatever your main big goal is. I want you to feel believe out of everything that I create. Rule number four, keep the community engaged. How do you come up with your video ideas to keep your community engaged? That's a combination of what do I want to make with what are people asking for? And I think that's at the success of any, any successful business, not just a YouTube channel, not just a podcast or a show. It's like, what do you love doing with where is there demand? If you take something that you just love doing, but nobody cares, you have a hobby. And, right? It could be a really fulfilling hobby, but it's just a hobby. And if you take something that everybody wants, but you don't really care about, you're never going to win because you're, you're doing work that you hate. And there's somebody else out there who loves doing that thing. And so don't spend your time doing work that you hate. So it's in that combination of like, what do I love doing with what do people actually want that every business can become successful? So for me, um, we get a lot of feedback from the audience. People leave comments like, hey, I, I love to see a video on blank. And maybe I know how to do that. And maybe I really resonate with that. Or maybe I don't. And, and then we don't. Um, or just starts with me saying, I think this could be a cool idea. And then I try to make that video and put it out there. Uh, and sometimes they take off and they do well and we do a lot more. And sometimes it completely flops. It's like, okay, cool. Well, nobody liked that. Move on to the next idea. I think the key though within all of that is I'm, we're not so attached to this thing having to work. A lot of times people, when they're first launching their YouTube channel, their business, their podcast, whatever, we put so much pressure on the, on the launch being perfect. And then if it doesn't work out, we feel like a failure. Where for me, it's just, okay, we're going to try that and we're going to try this and we're going to try that and, and something's going to work. And if that, that thing yesterday didn't work, cool. I've got 18 more ideas I'm going to try until I find the thing that does work. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number five find a mentor i think it's a really hard road to become an entrepreneur how did you find your mentor because that's that's really hard for a lot of people yeah the trick is when you when you find somebody who you like who you think they're ahead of you and you think they might have something to contribute like just you have to find a way to get closer to them mm -hmm. so I'll give you two stories. The first with me and Steve, uh, I met Steve through one of his clients. So one of his clients was in Toronto, same city as me, and we met at a coffee shop, and he had this idea for the, to pitch on a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that his agent came up with this idea. He's like, agent? Like, what do you mean, agent? Yeah. How do you have an agent? You're like a <laughs> business guy or like a YouTuber. How do you have an agent? Because yeah. I thought agents were only for sports stars or mm -hmm. musicians. Like, how do you? He's like, yeah, I have an agent. He represents like thought leaders. Like, ah, okay, can I, can I meet him? And uh, so he introduced me to Steve. I hopped on the call. Steve made me feel very uncomfortable, you know, in, the, in, all, the, in all the right ways. Yeah. Um, and, and that led to me wanting to do more with him, even though I didn't fit the typical mm -hmm. mold. mold. So it's, it's following the curiosity, right? If I never, I met, I met this guy in Toronto, his name was Sean. And if I never asked Sean about the agent, I wouldn't have had that conversation. Um, fast forward a couple years ago, there was a guy, Jeremy, who came to one of my events and he's paid like 2,500 bucks or something to come to this okay. event. He's 18, 19 years old. He is working as a grocery store clerk, okay. like hates his life, doesn't want to work grocery store, doesn't know what he really wants to do, likes my energy, saw my YouTube videos, come to the event. It's a three day event. At the end of the event, he messages me, he says, hey Evan, I just want to, like, how do I spend more time with you? I don't have any skills yet, but I'll, I'll walk your dog, I'll, I'll clean your car, wow. I'll mow your lawn, like I just want to spend more time with you. And I messaged him back, said, that's super amazing, Jeremy, but I don't, like, I don't need somebody to walk my dog or clean my car, but, um, but thank you. Um, a couple months later, I was driving on my tour, and I'm driving through this desert in Texas, and I think of Jeremy, and I thought, huh, maybe I could teach Jeremy YouTube. 
I get one there. People keep asking me about YouTube and they want me to do work on their channel and I don't, I don't want to do that as a business, but maybe I could teach Jeremy how to do it. And so we got Jeremy on the phone that moment. Oh, wow. uh, he, he took a little break from his grocery store you know, job and said, Jeremy, I want to teach you YouTube. We'll start a business together. And I'm away for the next two months on the road, so I need you to watch all of these videos and learn everything you can about YouTube. And when I come back, if you've done that, I'll help you build a YouTube consulting business. Wow. Um, and we did. And now he's got uh, a high six-figure YouTube business uh, consulting. He, he made six figures in the first six months or so wow. of having his business. Um, and that's from being a grocery store mm -hmm. clerk, right? But if he didn't do that outreach to me, I wouldn't have taken a shot on him either. It's just mm -hmm. the, the heart and the energy and the care. And he's just, I'll wash your car yeah. and I'll clean, you know, hang, hang out with your dog. I just love the energy. And even though nothing came up in the moment, he was in the back of my mind to say, okay, maybe I should do something with mm -hmm. Jeremy. And so it's, it's trying to be in a room where you get to talk to them, but then it's, it's almost uh, uncomfortable like next ask mm -hmm. and showing your hunger and your commitment level. And then the key thing is when you get that is you ask one question to the mentor because successful people actually love mentoring, but they also hate wasting time. Mm -hmm. Like time is the most valuable asset and they love mentoring, but they hate wasting time. And a lot of mentees waste time because yeah. they don't do the work. So the best thing you can do if, you want, if you're trying to get into a mentorship relationship, you ask one question. Like, what's the one question? You've got to ask Robert Kiyosaki one yeah. question. Like, <laughs> what's the one question that you want to ask him, right? Mm -hmm. And then don't ask another question because that's what people will do. They'll come back and say, oh, what about this? And what about that? It's like, no, no, no. Like, do the work on the first question that he gave you an answer for. Yeah. And then go home and actually do the work. And if you get a result, then you can come back and ask the second question. Hey, I asked you this, I did this. Now my, I've got five apartments, man, thank you from the, your advice. Now I'm struggling with this. He's much more likely to give you a second answer because of the work you did on the first one. Yeah. Or if the advice didn't work, make sure that you tried it a hundred times, yeah. right? It wasn't just, you tried, you made one phone call and it didn't work mm -hmm. and so the, the advice sucked, right? Because if you tried it a hundred times and you showed the effort, then he's willing to answer a second question. Rule number six, be with the right people. Evan, you have a brand new book called Momentum. I love the word momentum. I think it's the hardest thing to get and the easiest thing to lose. Why the book Momentum and why now, brother? Uh, I actually wasn't planning on writing the book at all. Built to Serve was my book. I was like, it's still the book. And then I did a, a session with my now business partner, uh, Kira. And we did an IG Live together. And she kind of pulled it out of me. And... Uh, this idea just came out like momentum. That's, that's the book. I often tell people the only thing they're missing is momentum. Like you, you have the heart and you have the idea and you have the, the willingness to serve and like you're doing it for the right reasons and you deserve to make money. What's missing? Just momentum. Like you're overthinking, you're over, you're over, you're over planning. You're just over, over, and you're not doing enough like momentum. Uh, and so she challenged me to write the book in eight weeks. My first book took me a year to write. And then she said, well, when are you going to start? And the book's called Momentum, right? It's like, when, of course, I have to start now. Like, I'm going to start next week. I'm going to start in a month. Like, no, I have to eat my own dog food. And so I wrote it. Uh, I wrote it, like, got off the call with her at 3 p.m. Eastern and just started writing. And I wrote it in five days. It's like, this book was written in five days, and we ended up having it published in eight weeks. And so when you're, you're to Dave's point of, like, when you're in the right frequency and around the right people and hitting the right vibration, like, you can create magic, and if you're not, it's because you're in the wrong frequency, you're around the wrong people, and you have the wrong thinking in your head too. Rule number seven, stop being a perfectionist. What system or process do you have or are used for your filming and editing? Is there a particular methodology? Um, I think that's evolved over the years. At the beginning, I probably spent way too much time trying to figure all the stuff out. You know, my first video took me a full day to record because I was trying to, it was one video. It's like six minutes. It took a whole day to record because <laughs> I was trying to get it perfect and the camera and the lighting. And my friend came in who's a professional videographer and he filmed me and I had to memorize my script. And uh, over the years has gotten a lot more streamlined and faster. And I've cared less about it being perfect and more about me just showing up and trying to connect more to the heart and less to the head. If we had done this interview even three years ago, I would have said, okay, I need to know what are Alan's questions going to be. I want to know what his questions are uh, because I wanted to have an answer because 
I would be afraid of. I don't want to disappoint your audience. I don't want you to ask me some question. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know. But what would end up happening is I give a really prepared, rehearsed answer, which then doesn't actually bring the most value to your community. And so instead, it's like, I don't want to know the questions. I don't want to know, you know what you're going to ask me. Let's just go with it and hope that um, I have enough inside me to be able to share. And so I wish I had done that sooner. You know, if you look back, I, I probably wouldn't have made changes. But like, if I could talk to Evan, who's starting this channel at the beginning, it's like, don't be so stressed out about saying the perfect words and having the perfect lighting and gear and editing process. Just go make, create. And the more you can connect in your heart instead of your head and what you think is perfect, the better results you'll actually have. Rule number eight, learn to manage your team. Where do we learn to manage people? You don't learn that in school. Right? We don't learn how to manage people. We're taught usually the opposite in school, which Robert yeah. loves talking about. It's like, so it's low. cheating. It's yeah. cheating to look at somebody else's test or work yeah. together, right? You got to do it all by yourself. Mm -hmm. But like, that's the opposite in business. You have to do it as a team. Mm -hmm. So, where do we learn the ability to manage and delegate? We don't, right? I, mean, I think a lot of people, even if you think about school projects, we're usually the ones like hard carrying the school project. Or we're taught to be like the smartest person in the room, right? Like you always want to compete against the person next to you. Yeah. Or Robert teaches us like, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You want your team to be the smartest yeah. people in the room. Mm -hmm. It's completely counter to what we learn in, in the school system. So, so great. You know, if, if you've never led somebody before, you're probably not going to be a great boss. It doesn't mean you're going to be a terrible boss, you're going to chew them out and they're going to hate you, but you need to learn how to actually manage people. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier to manage somebody for an hour a day part time while you're still running your company than to have a full time person who you're now committed to. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that the first employee at any company is still there. Look at employee number one and 10 years yeah. later, like that person's gone. Not because the person sucked, it's because you sucked. As, As a leader. leader. Yeah, like you don't yeah. know how to hire, you don't know how to delegate, you don't know mm -hmm. how to manage, you don't know how to train. We think that we get somebody in and then, oh, this person's just gonna take off all my problems. No. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta train yeah, them, you gotta, you gotta mentor them, you gotta mm -hmm. help. And so it's easier to get started. Like that's a skill that, you will, that will serve you for the rest of your life, no matter what you end up doing. Rule number nine, get inspired. I'm a big believer that the ideas that come to you when you're feeling bold, excited, powerful, inspired, like those are the right ones for you. And then we spend most of our time talking ourselves down from like why we can't do those things. So if, you, if you're watching a Craig video or a Dave video, you're hanging out and you get inspired, like that idea, that's, the, that's, the, that's your best version talking to you. And you owe it to you to go do something and take the first step. Like you get inspired to go start your own IG live or your own YouTube channel. Awesome. Like just make a video. People get caught up like, well, what camera and what microphone and what am I going to talk about? And then it's like, you're, it's over. It's over. Like just... Press record and make your first video. That's the first step. And that's like people take a decade to get to the first step. That's the problem. So the ideas that come to you when you're feeling bold, those are the right ones for you. Rule number 10, the last one before some special bonus clip, pursue your passion. What are some of your best tips and practices for entrepreneurs staying charged, staying focused, and growing really in their leadership and as entrepreneurs? So first off, I think you have to be doing something that you absolutely love. If you look at any of the successful entrepreneurs you look up to, or in any field, athletes, singers, musicians, artists, you have to love the work of what you're doing yeah. and not just try to be YouTube famous. If you're watching this, trying to be YouTube famous, it's not gonna get you anywhere. You have to love the actual process of tip. making videos and being able to influence people. Yeah, but editing wise, that you landed that plane. Yeah, yeah. Love it, okay, so what else? The other important thing really is that you need to have a morning routine that sets you up for success. So we talked about like what's one thing that you can't miss. Yeah. You need to have that can't miss stuff in your morning routine to get you charged and energized because too often what happens is people get motivated. You watch one of these videos, you're not subscribed yet, you haven't hit the bell, so you only watch one video, you get all pumped and the next day you wake up and like it's gone. Yeah. And we all we all have that. We don't say we do, but we have it. You wake yeah. up. Nobody wakes up every day like mega passionate. No doubt. To go. And so you need to whatever that is that gets you excited. If it's if it's watching this guy every day, then watch him every day. Like you need to put that into your morning routine so that you start your day feeling energized and bold and on fire to go do amazing things as opposed to shrinking down and then hoping by accident you come across something that gets you pumped up. Stop trying to do this alone. If you've got a big idea inside you, you can't do this alone. 
You need people around you to help you, to encourage you, to support you, to cover your weaknesses, to help you actually go off and accomplish that big dream of yours. This is one of the biggest things that I think holds people back, holds entrepreneurs back, is you're probably decently good at the thing that you want to do. You know, you've had some experience or you've gone and learned and figured it out and you still to get better as you keep practicing and keep going and doing more. And maybe at some point you even did try to hire somebody. Maybe at some point you did try to bring somebody on and it didn't work out. It didn't work out. And here's where everybody makes the mistake. You retreat and go back to say, you know what? It was just a lot faster when I did it myself. Has that happened? Has that happened to you? Ever been there? You hired somebody. You thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hire somebody. You do it. It doesn't work out. And then you go back to say, I'm just going to do this all myself. No, (laughs) no, 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 no. That is not the answer. That is not the answer. That's like if you go on one date and it doesn't work out, now you're never going to go on another date again. You're never going to be married, right? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. You're living in fear as opposed to actually trying to build the thing that you're capable of building. Here's what happens. When you first hire somebody, you don't know what you're doing, right? It's like when you first did anything, you don't know what you're doing. So why do you expect to be great at picking the right person and then treating them well and then managing them well? You don't know what you're doing. Uh, there's a guy in my movement makers who, who joined my Discord as well. And um, he was talking about how he had hired his second video editor and it didn't work out. And he had to let the person go. So he's hired two video editors. Both of them couldn't get his style and he had to let them go and he's going back to editing everything himself. Now, as a short-term solution, great. Like, stuff has to get up, videos have to be edited, get them out. But don't stop searching just because you had two failed hires, right? Like, if you tomorrow are editing videos, awesome. But if you next year are still editing your videos, not awesome. No, not awesome, not anymore, right? This is how we start to raise our standards. And so the first two people that you hired weren't good fits. Great. Keep searching. Keep looking. Your perfect fit is out there. And as you go through some people and go through the process, you'll get better at actually finding the right person. You know, you'll get better at it. Don't judge yourself to say, well, I suck at this. I can't hire. I'm never going to find the person. It's just faster to do it myself. Right? There's that old expression. You can go fast by yourself, but you go far with the team. You have to build a team. You've got your biz dev show. And the point of the biz dev show is to bring ideal clients on. If you don't think they're an ideal client or they could refer ideal clients to you, then they're not on the show. I get the light bulb on this morning was to uh, mm-hmm. uh, pick entrepreneurs, choose entrepreneurs to come on to an entrepreneurship show. And in our mind, uh, well, in my mind, Entrepreneurs would probably watch it because I'm talking to an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I really, my mind is really shifted. Yeah, but if they're coming on and just listen to somebody else's story. That doesn't. Why yeah. would I then hire you? I don't know. I, I, you're just mm-hmm. Larry King asking questions. You're a great mm-hmm. question asker. Right. Okay. Well, I'm not hiring you for that. So. Unless your goal is to be an MC or to host shows or something else, then then that's a different model, right? But if like I'm a coach and I want to sell more coaching services, then that that's a better model. So you're bringing people if they don't if they're either not an ideal client, meaning they have a business and they can afford your services, like if it's a brand new startup and they're dead broke, it's not an mm-hmm. ideal client because they can't afford you. So ideal clients or referral partners lawyers, accountants, those kinds of people who deal with entrepreneurs all day long. Like if you have the right lawyer on and they love you, they could be referring every so, client. How you are like connecting with your followers on a level um, that is adding value to them, but is allowing them to continue to consume your content. One, you have to love it. Mm-hmm. Like I love connecting with the community. Okay. So there's a lot of people who, who don't love it and you don't have to do it, right? So mm. I remember I was in New York and I was meeting a really big name author, you know, New York Times bestseller, et cetera. And 
I was in town. He said, hey, let's go grab breakfast. So we grabbed breakfast together. And, and he said, well, what are you doing for the rest of the day? He's like, oh, I'm going to have lunch with another fan who said he like, became a millionaire after watching my content. And then we're going to do an afternoon meet up at a Starbucks with you know, my fans in New York. And we're just going to chill at a Starbucks yeah. and ask questions. I don't care about seeing New York. I just care about meeting the people. And he said, that sounds exhausting. Like, oh, what are you going to do? It's like, I'm going to go back to my room and write. And he's had tons of success as a writer, right? So yeah. it's not that one way is better than the other. Mm -hmm. It's just that I, I love doing it. And so it's tapping into, like, if that's where you get your energy from, of the audience that you have and people listening to you, watching you, et cetera, then that's where the thing needs to be birthed, not mm -hmm. from, uh, this is a good strategy, so I guess I should do it. Right? So inside of that, I do things like that, where I do meetups in cities when I travel. Okay. Uh, even here, inviting you back. It's like you message me. It's like, hey, what are you doing on Tuesday? You want to come by and yeah. do something you know, for content too? And every day I'll do Instagram questions. If you see my stories, I always put a question. And then at the end of the night, my evening routine, no matter how tired I am, I'm still like responding to questions. I'll do like 10 questions. And you're, doing, you're responding yourself. Yeah, it's me. Like when I'm helping people, I try to do it where there's scalability to it as well. Okay. So, you know, the, the people who are here today that I'm helping, they're helping, but it's also content, so other people can learn from it, hopefully, in, in your story, right? When I'm doing Instagram Q&A, it's mm -hmm. on my stories, so people can leave a question, I'll answer it for everybody. Okay. Right? Um, I still do a lot of one-on-ones in the DMs as well, but the, there's just not enough time in the day to hit Everyone. Even the questions that come in every day, I don't have time yeah. to do everybody. But it's more of a heart thing where it's like it, I need that as part of my mm. nightly routine to okay. stay connected to the work. Because otherwise it becomes, why am I doing this stuff? You know, the yeah. numbers start to blur and not mean much. Right. You know, you had a million or two million or whatever. It's like, okay, I don't, I don't know what that means. But mm. somebody saying your video changed my life, you saying, you know, I've watched your videos for eight years every day to learn from somebody new. That, that's why I do what I do. I need to feel connected to who I'm serving or helping. Okay. And in doing that, then it makes me want to show up more. Because if you're just making videos in your office, or you're just yeah. recording the song in the studio, and you can't connect to like who it's going to actually help, uh, at least for me, it's not as powerful. You become who you consistently hang around with, who you spend the majority of your time with, both people who you're actually physically meeting and connecting with and hanging out with, and what you feed into your brain. That's how you start to think. That's how you start to behave. That's how you start to act. Think about your mindsets, your belief systems. It comes from the people who you're consistently around. So if you want to change your life, you want to change your direction, you're tired of living where you are, you're tired of your situation right now, the fastest way to change it is to change who you start to associate with. I remember when I first got uh, started on my entrepreneurial career, I always felt like I was kind of a dummy. Um, I was a slow learner in school. I never got, I, never, I didn't fail out of class, but I never got the straight A's, you know, that my sisters kept getting. And what I realized was I'm not dumb. I just need the right models and the right mentors. I had a different way of learning than a lot of people. And when I started to figure that out, I was like, I'm not, I'm not an idiot. I'm not dumb. I can do this, but I need to be around the people who are doing it because, because when I can get that mentorship, when I can get that learning style down, then I can do amazing things. That's it, that's the only difference. The only difference is I just don't have the right people around me. And I learned that lesson over and over and over and over again, that when I just try to figure it out myself, I usually don't win. When I'm doing a structured learning style, like in a classroom setting, I also usually don't win. But when I can surround myself with the people who are doing it and get the, the coaching and mentorship and guidance that I need, I can, I can win, I can actually do stuff. <laughs> it was a big, big revelation, I'm not a dummy like I thought I was growing up. Uh, and so how do you do it? How do you actually start to be around the people who are inspiring you, lifting you up? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share three strategies that I think will help. Okay? The first is actual people in your life. So you start to audit the people in your life. How much are the people in your life building you up, making you believe in yourself, giving you encouragement, giving you support, giving you love, telling you that you can do it? How many people do you have like that in your life? Probably not a lot. 
most of us probably don't have that many people. And so you want to immediately cut out the people who uh, are not giving you that hope and encouragement or at least spending less time with them because maybe that's your mom, right? So spending less time or, or not talking about your career or your business with the people who don't support you and then injecting more of the people who do and fighting to find ways to spend more time with the people who lift you up, who make you feel like things are possible, fighting to spend more time with them. I have an expression that I use uh, where I like, to uh, I like to collect good people. I like to collect good people, I like to have people around me that make me feel great. And when I find somebody, I fight to try to spend more time with them, whether it's start a business with them, whether that's uh, do a, a monthly call with them. Think about who's made you feel the best, who, who is somebody that you know, and it probably isn't your parents or, or close family members, there's somebody in, in the outer ring of your circle. How can you now regularly spend more time with them? An easy starting point is a monthly coffee. How can you have a monthly coffee with them to talk about your business ideas and where you're going? So you wanna to try to inject more of that positivity uh, into your circle, into your group, into your life. Set number two is the aspirational people that you may never meet, but you can be surrounded by. So if you love Warren Buffett, hey, maybe, maybe Warren Buffett's not gonna sit down with you for a monthly coffee to chat about your business and your ideas, but there's his videos, there's his books, there's lots of stuff on YouTube. You can start with my channel. There's a lot of content that you can learn. If you watched a Warren Buffett video every day, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna start to think like him. You're gonna start to adopt his mindset, his mentality. You're gonna, you're gonna take on his belief systems a little bit more. And so the more you're around Warren Buffett, the more you're gonna start to process things like him and think like him. And so you may never meet him. For all the people who are watching this and say, well, I don't know anybody who's had success. Okay, well, you don't need to but you can still learn from the people who've done it. That's the beauty of YouTube right now. That's, that's everything that I've learned. I, learned. I learned how to get out of the hole I was in with my first business by learning from Bill Gates. I still have never met Bill Gates, but he saved my company because I learned from his story. Because I was willing to, at that time, read books. Uh, now I would much prefer to watch videos and to, to read books on the topic, but however you learn, videos, books, podcasts, your heroes are making content be around them more. Be around them more because they will lift you up. They will make you feel like things are possible when the people around you are telling you all the reasons why you're not going to win. And then step number three is, is join some kind of group. Join some kind of group, some kind of uh, community, some kind of connection where you can be around like-minded people. The one that uh, I use a lot is my Movement Makers program. So inside Movement Makers, we meet every two weeks talking about a different tactic to grow your movement and also connecting people together. It becomes a family. When you're the only one in your circle doing something, man, it's so hard to keep going, to keep the motivation, to, to be the person who's constantly lifting other people up. Who's doing that for you? So whether it's Movement Makers or some other program, get into one where you're around your peers, when you're around people who are also trying to do big things, when you're around somebody else who's trying to have a big impact and change the world. And when you're saying even language like that, you know, if I'm talking about, I want to build something to change the world, you know, most of the people shopping here at Costco are like, when, who's this crazy guy? You can't do that, right? That's most of the people around us. But when you find your tribe of people who are also trying to do something big, something scary, something crazy, you start to feel like, this is possible, finally, yes, right? And so, whether it's movie makers or something else, to get a part of a network of people, your peers. So in the early, the first two bits of advice, you're learning from people who are, who've done more than you, but being just around peers who are doing the same thing, maybe in a different industry, but they're, they're trying to chase down their goals, you can motivate each other. So that when you're feeling down, they, they give you a little bit of extra jet fuel and, and you do the same for them. You fill them up when they need it. Because that little extra bit can make the difference between you quitting and you going off and spending one more day, and that one day might be the difference between you building a giant company or working at some job that you hate for the rest of your life. And so your heroes really matter. The people you surround yourself with really matters. There's only so much you can do completely by yourself. You know, the fastest way to win is to, is to model success, and so you can do that. You can do that. If you follow those three steps, if you start to weed out the people from your life who are just filling you with negativity and spend more time with good people, learn to collect good people. If you learn from your aspirational mentors and you watch their videos, make it part of your daily routine. 
That's why I make so much content, because there's always somebody you can learn from. But there's no excuse. We, I don't know how many videos we do every single day, a lot of different videos every single day. <laughs> why? Because there's no excuse now for you not to be surrounded by your heroes, to learn something from them, to be educated by them, to be inspired by them. Every single day, whether it's my videos or something else, to inject that as part of your daily routine in the morning. It really, really matters. And then three, to join a group, some kind of peer group, be around people who are doing things that you can lean on and ask for their support and that you can, you can support them as well when they need the help. You do those three things, your life will change. Influencing someone starts with you being their chief goal officer. That is your job. Be their chief goal officer. You have to understand what their values are. You have to understand what their ambitions are. You have to understand who they are before you can influence them. The worst advice that you can give somebody, this is, this is a challenge that a lot of leaders face when they're building their organization. The worst advice you can give somebody is what you would do. The worst advice you can give somebody is what you would do because they're not you because they have different values, because they have different ambitions, because they want a different path than what you've taken. And so if you just say, here's what I would do, and then you come off and feeling like you're a hero and a genius, you've maybe screwed them over. And so you need to start by being a chief goal officer. If people are not listening to you, if people are not following your orders, if people do not respect you, it's because you're giving them wrong advice because you have not done the work to be their chief goal officer and then help them accomplish what they want to accomplish and figure out the best path for them. Okay, so how do you become somebody's chief goal officer? I'm gonna give you three ways to do it. Step number one is know their one word and credo. Your one word is your most important core value, the thing that you stand on, and the credo are the three things that make up that define what that one word is for people. When I first wrote the book, Your One Word, I didn't anticipate it being a leadership book. I thought it'd be just something that you use for yourself, but it's shocking how many people now buy the book and give it to their team. So you get a window of what your team's core values are so you know how to move and inspire them as an example. Example, if their one word, if somebody in your team's one word is freedom, then it gives you a window of how to handle that person. They don't want to be micromanaged. They don't want to be told what to do 24 seven. They need to have some freedom in their decision making and controls so they can go off and do their job so they, they can express themselves so that they can have fun and be happy. The more you are handcuffing them, the more they feel like you're putting them in a jail, the more you're going to lose and you're not going to influence them. So step number one is figure out for everyone on your team, what are their one words and credos? Step number two is what are their ambitions? What do they want? What do they want to accomplish? Are they trying to make a lot of money? Are they trying to move to another country? Are they trying to learn some certain skills? Like what do they want? What are they here for? What are they trying to get? Because yes, they're here to do a job. Yes, you want them to figure out how to do X, Y, Z because you have a business target and you're trying to accomplish that thing. Awesome. They're a human being. They're not a robot. They're not a monkey. They're not just typing things in for you so you can accomplish your goals. You have your goals and they have their own set of goals. And if you are not being their chief goal officer, if you do not understand what their ambitions are, then you're going to lose. Then you're going to give them tasks that they don't want to do anymore, that they're going to grow and learn and want to expand and you don't know how they want to expand and they're going to quit and they're going to leave you and you're not going to be able to push them forward. You have to do the job of figuring out how if they want to go here, this is their ambition and they're here right now, you have to make that path visible. You have to show them how they can go from here to here and then you put everything that they're doing in that light. So this is the path. I want you to get here too. I know you want to be here. I want you to get here. Here's how to get there. And they may not see it because they haven't experienced it yet. They may not be able to tie the dots together to say, oh, if I do this, I'll be able to get there. That's your job. Help them. Be their chief goal officer. Understand their ambitions. Step number two. And then step number three is how can you run parallel paths together? So it's pretty unlikely that somebody on your team will stay with you forever. They have ambitions, they have goals, they want to get somewhere. And if you understand what their goals are and you know where you want to go, then great, you're running this parallel path together. And that parallel path might be for three months, it might be for a year, it might be for six years, or it might be forever. But at some point, they want to go off and do something else. You're a stepping stone for them to get somewhere else. And that's awesome. You should celebrate that. Don't fear that. Celebrate that. And then figure out how you can be a part of their success, how you can run that parallel path together. And then when they're ready, push them away. Like, you're ready. You should go off and do that thing now. Go do that thing. You're ready. You shouldn't be with me anymore. Figure out how you can run the parallel paths together and then help them go and be the person that they want to be once they've hit the end of the road with you. So that's a three-step process to being somebody's chief goal officer. One, figure out what their one word and credo are. Two, figure out what their ambitions are. And then three, figure out how can you run parallel paths together. With YouTube, 
I feel like this is my moment. I feel like I know what I'm doing. I feel like I have my window, however long it's gonna last. It could be six months, 12 months, 24 months. I gotta push as hard as I can. I feel like we're really hitting it. I think it's a great combination of everything that I love doing, my skill sets, my interests, my passion right now, to provide value to myself and to you guys. And so that's why I'm pushing hard. I'm making three videos a day. I go to my website, I had a shift where I said, you know what, I want to solve the world's biggest problem, untapped human potential. What does that look like? I don't know. When I first launched it, I had no idea. I deleted my entire website, threw up one picture, and that was my homepage. If you go right now, you'll see it's still a bunch of pictures. I had a little bit more meat to the bones, but I still don't know where it's going. I don't have all the answers around it. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I figure it out by doing, by testing, by having conversations. And so from a SEO perspective, my website sucks. But I wasn't interested in the direction I was going anymore. I switched, and so I had to find a way to get started. And so I did it myself. My website has now what I call the circle of potential, and all of those points, you can click on it and dive a little bit deeper. Somebody made a comment when he clicked on the first version of my self-awareness button. He said, well, it's only promoting your stuff. It should have a, a wider range. You're right. I don't have the answer yet. I'm figuring it out. And so I don't let the fear of making mistakes prevent me from doing anything. Because if I waited until I had the whole thing figured out, what the perfect website would look like, I'd never launch it. And having a website that's not complete and building some momentum with it drives me to want to do more on it. Drives me to want to figure out more details on it. And so some pages are more worked out than others, but all of them need a lot more work. And it just came from that initial idea, that initial thesis, that as soon as you have an idea for something, you find immediate ways to take action on it because the momentum is so, 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 so important. The biggest risk of all is not taking any risk at all. Every day there's a battle raging inside you. The battle is between the comfort version of yourself and the growth version of yourself. The comfort you wants to be comfortable, doesn't want to push, wants to stay where you are, it's, it's difficult, it's scary out there, let's stay warm and comfortable. And the growth version of you wants to grow, wants to learn, wants to develop, wants to progress, wants to serve, wants to help. And doing that requires having courage, boldness, and jumping into the unknown. And it's a daily battle. It's a daily battle that never goes away and you have to choose who consistently is going to win. And those daily battles are not won by doing the big heroic once a year things, it's won by doing the daily things, the daily small things that shift your identity forward to teach yourself that you're the growth kind of person and not the comfort kind of person. The first time I met Brendan Burchard was at his event at uh, growth.com. I was speaking in Phoenix. It was his event. I was one of two guest speakers. It was him and his partner speaking, and then me and Eric Thomas. And his business partner invited me to come and speak, and flew me down there. And I'd never met Brendan before. I knew, uh, I knew of him, obviously, uh, but I didn't, never met him face to face. And when I, when I met him, he came backstage, uh, I think it was the day before I was going to go speak, and I met him backstage, and he said, hey, I can't, I can't wait to, to, to see you on stage. Uh, I almost never bring on guest speakers who I haven't seen speak before, but you came highly recommended by my business partner, so let's do this. And I'm gonna watch your speech and see what you do. Uh, I have a TV interview that I'm doing and I'm gonna pause that and make sure I'm done so I can watch your speech. So <laughs> in my head, there's a lot of stress and pressure. One, I never met Brendan before. Two, there's a couple thousand people out there in the audience. Uh, and three, usually when speakers are on stage, the other speakers aren't super paying attention. You know, they're backstage in their own world doing their own thing, but Brendan was gonna end his interview to make sure that he was gonna watch my speech. And so he's adding all this extra pressure on me. This is the battle of, of growth versus comfort, of growth Evan versus comfort Evan. My biggest fear is disappointing people. I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to disappoint the person who, who paid me to be there. I don't want to disappoint the couple thousand people in the audience. And so we go through these moments where the comfort you takes over. The comfort you wants to play small, wants to quit, wants to back down, wants to find an out, wants to find an excuse for why you can't do something. And the growth you is struggling for control. There's two things that I do 
that help growth oven come out. And I want you to internalize them, to apply them, to use them, because if you can use these two strategies, it can massively shift your identity forward, help you become the growth version of you instead of the comfort version of you, and start giving you the results you want, as well as a more purposeful, happy life of service. Two things. First one, take on the identity that you do difficult things. You do difficult things. That if something is scary or difficult or hard, that it's not a good enough reason. That you do scary, you do difficult, you love hard. And so I use those as triggers. And why it's important is you shortcut the thinking pattern. Every time that you say that it's scary, that it's difficult, that it's hard, or whatever words that you use that give yourself a break, that let yourself off the hook, use those as trigger words. The fact that you said it means you have to do it. The fact that you said it, you thought it, you wrote it, means you have to do it just because. What it does is it shortcuts the excuse because what normally happens is you say, well, that's, that's too difficult. You've accepted that difficult is a good enough reason for you to play small. You don't go and do the thing. You've accepted in the excuses that come into your head over why you can't do it. And they're not, you don't call them excuses. You call them, you call them reasons, right? Logical, valid reasons why you can't do it. I want to shortcut all that. I don't want to even allow you to go there because I don't allow myself to go there. The fact that I said scary, difficult, hard is mean I have to do it. So find your trigger words. You can use mine as a starting point if you want, but find your trigger words and that becomes your new identity. You want to take on the identity that you do difficult things, that you, you jump into the unknown that those are no longer good enough reasons for you. And so I did this when I was backstage, when I'm, my heart's beating, uh, I'm, I'm, I forgot what I was gonna say going on stage. Like in the moments leading up to going on stage, I forgot what I was gonna say. I have no slides either on stage, right? I don't go with a PowerPoint presentation. There's one slide, it just has my, my name and face on it. That's it, no slides. As if I forget what I'm gonna say, <laughs> kinda screwed. So breathe. I, Evan Carmichael does difficult things. I do difficult things, right? You remind yourself. But what that does is put you into a more resourceful state to go and actually solve the problem. So that's step one. You do difficult things. And, and again, it's not just the big hero moments, it's the micro. There's difficult things that have happened already today that you have not done what you need to do. Because it was difficult and you give yourself an out. Go do it. What that does for your self-love, for your self-pride, for your self-respect, for your self-confidence is incredible. And, and you need to give yourself that gift. I want you to give yourself that gift every day of doing a difficult thing. And for you, something that's difficult may seem trivial or small for somebody else. When I broke my neck and, uh, and, and was struggling with a concussion, getting out of bed was difficult. Just getting out of bed and putting my feet on the ground and standing up was incredible pain through my spine. Incredible pain, which is something I take for granted now, but that was difficult. And so when, when those things happen, you pat yourself on the back. You did it. You did the difficult thing. So that's step number one. You do difficult things. The second mindset shift is leaning into service. It's not even about you. Newsflash, it's not about you. You're here to serve. You're here to help. You're, you're, for all the ambitions that you have for yourself, whatever the thing is that you're afraid to do, usually the thing we're afraid to do is in front of somebody else. You're not afraid of failing, you're afraid of failing and who's gonna see you fail, right? You will sing in the shower, but you won't sing on the street corner, why? People will film videos at, in, in home, at their home, but not film it on the street where people can see them because you're afraid of being watched. You're not afraid of failing, you're afraid of failing in front of other people. You need to stop being selfish, get out of your own head, and recognize that you're here to serve. You're here to help. You've got a message, knowledge, information that can help people. And by you playing small, you're doing a disservice to them and to yourself. And so that's the other thing that I'll lean into is, yeah, Evan Carmichael does difficult things, but also I'm here to serve. And so when I'm backstage and I'm, <laughs> I know Brendan's gonna watch me, and I know thousands of people are watching me and I'm afraid of disappointing everybody, I look out into the audience and instead of seeing 2,000 people who are here to judge me and I'm gonna disappoint them, I'm here looking at them saying, I have a message that can help them. I'm here to serve them. Because what I'm gonna share, Brendan doesn't know. Eric Thomas doesn't know. 
the other speakers here, his partners, they don't know. I can share something unique that can help them and my, my intention is good. I'm here to help these people, not rip them off, not lead them down a dark path. I'm here to help them. And that, again, shifts how you feel about yourself to give you the courage, the boldness, the motivation, the power to go and then do the thing that the growth version of you needs. That's how you get out of the comfort zone. That's how you get out of comfort you, scared you, small you, into powerful you, bold you, courageous you, growth you. Number one, you do difficult things. Anytime you find yourself complaining, scary, difficult, hard, negative, you do difficult things. And number two, you're here to serve. You're here to serve, you're here to help, you're trying to do good, and keeping your gifts to yourself is selfish, and you have to share it and get it out there. Those two things on a daily basis, on a daily basis, every single day, that's that battle raging inside your head between the growth you and the comfort you. And my ambition, my intention, my goal for you is to have growth you win a little bit more than comfort you. It's not gonna be 100% growth you. There's no way that's gonna happen. Don't make that perfection the bar. It's that every day, growth you wins at least 51% of the battles versus comfort you. You do that, your life will change. The language you use about yourself when you're by yourself is what will make or break your self-esteem. When we talk to other people, when we post on Instagram, when we share our lives, we always wanted to, to look good and be amazing and be so positive, right? Most people's Instagram stories are, are just all of these amazing highlights and how beautiful my perfect life is. And then you go home and you're by yourself and you look at yourself in the mirror and people you know, cry themselves to sleep. What's the message when you talk to yourself? What's the message when you're alone? What are you saying about yourself? When you can start to fix that self-talk, that inner dialogue, that starts to shift everything inside you to then create amazing things outside you. I remember when I first got started making YouTube videos, my self-talk was uh, in conflict because I had my parents, who I remember, the voice, you know, there's a picture of my parents behind me on my wall in my office. And when people ask me, what's my favorite quote of all time? It's, it's what my parents used to tell me that I am Evan Castrilli Carmichael. I could do anything that I believe that I can. And that is a constant reminder that I still today, you know, at 41, still use, still tell myself, still remind myself of like, I am Evan Castrilli Carmichael. I could do anything that I believe that I can. <laughs> and it's helpful and valuable and what a gift. Um, so grateful for my parents for that. When I was getting started on YouTube though, the other voice that was in my head was, you're introverted, you're shy, you suck on camera. Um, anybody who makes videos has a big ego, just needs to be famous. And so I really struggled with that because I had competing voices in my head. It wasn't even what other people were telling me to do. It was me, myself, when I'm by myself, thinking about myself. That constant inner struggle with the voices in my head left me struggling, left me making super slow progress, left me started and stopping and started and stopping. If you look at my videos, I started and then I took big breaks and then I started again, then I took more big breaks. And it wasn't until I solved that inner conflict that I started to get more results and I started to be more uh, productive and I started to stop stopping. I started to stop stopping. I stopped procrastinating. I just did it because I wasn't so caught up in my head and the discussion and the inner dialogue and the voices. And I just replaced it with better thinking about myself, better messages to myself. I think when you can do that, your life starts to change because it's not other people's opinions that we, that really shape us. It's other people's opinions that then influence our own self-talk that then that's what shape us. What do I do with my life? One of the most important questions that I get asked over and over and over and over again, people are struggling with, what do I do with my life? You see your parents doing something, you see your friends doing something, you know that that's not the life that you want, but you're afraid of actually chasing down your dreams. You see people living their life on Instagram and it's so beautiful and perfect, and you're worried that you're not gonna measure up that you're not gonna live up to it, that if you try and do your thing, 
you're gonna fail. And so you're constantly stuck in this, what do I do with my life? Pull between the safe life that everybody around you is living and they want you to live for yourself or the dream life that you know you're capable of but you don't know quite what it looks like. What do I do with my life? Here's what I found. You're gonna have moments in your life where you have absolute clarity and equally, you'll have moments in your life where you have zero clue what to do. <laughs> Let's break those two down. When you have absolute clarity, when you know exactly what you wanna do, when it feels right, when you have momentum, the best thing you can do is put your blinders on and go to work. The best thing you can do is shut down everything else and get to work building your dream. We often hedge, we often play small, we often don't put as much in because we're afraid. But when you have those moments of clarity, you have to go play a bigger game. You have to start betting on yourself. Right now, I look at my YouTube channels as an example. This is a pretty special moment in time. And things are very well aligned for me right now. I mean, been doing YouTube for 12 years, built up a lot of traction, have a lot of momentum, been helping a lot of my friends, made a lot of new friends as a result of the channel, got into rooms that otherwise I shouldn't be in because of the success of my channels. And it's been a lot of work. And the early years did not pay off very well at all. I share on my Instagram uh, a lot of my traction and you know, first five years of the channel, we didn't even have 10,000 subscribers in the first five years. And then we went and hit, you know, next five years, two million subscribers, and now passing three million subscribers on the main channel. But a lot of, a lot of slow, slow, slow growth. But right now is a very special moment in time. Right now, I need to push harder on the YouTube channels. Right now, we've launched, I don't know how many channels, a lot of channels. We've got a dozen channels plus maybe at this point. I need to be pushing more on YouTube. This is a moment in time. This is the window here is so wide open that I need to jump through it because at some point it will close. And and I don't wanna look back on this moment and say, I wish I pushed harder. I wish I wasn't afraid. I wish I, I did the thing that I knew was right. And we'll have it. Uh, you'll have those moments too in your life where you just see it so clearly. You you have this vision. You, you see it all working out, but you're afraid to go actually take the action. You're afraid to go all in on it. You're afraid to do what is necessary. And then what ends up happening is regret because you'll be at the end of your life or even 10 years later thinking, I, I knew it, I saw it so clearly. There was this opportunity in front of me and I wanted to do it and I loved to do it, but I was too afraid and somebody went else, somebody else went off and made millions of dollars off of my idea. Does that ever happen to you? Somebody made millions off of my idea. Well, no, they just went and took action when you were sitting being afraid. And so when you have those moments of clarity, you have to push everything else aside and go after that thing. Even though it's scary, even though it's too big, even though it feels beyond you, you have to go after that thing because that's where your genius lies. And you either lean into your genius and go change the world or you live the rest of your life with regret. You have to force it. You did not ask for this painful situation that you're going through right now. You did not ask for this health issue, for this work issue, for this environmental issue. You, did, you didn't ask for this thing to happen to you. This is where we struggle because you didn't cause this. It's probably not your fault, right? Maybe it is your fault, but it's probably not your fault, this thing that's happened. There's a lot that happened to make this thing happen for you right now. And so it's so easy to get stuck in the land of negativity, why me, woe is me, why did this happen? As opposed to flipping to say, it's the best. This thing that's happening to me right now, it's the best. <laughs> when I broke my neck, I was on my tour, I broke my neck. What I said was, it's the best. It's the best. Is it actually good to break my neck? Mm, probably not, but it's, it's my chance to show myself what I'm capable of. I remember being woken up, so I, I passed out. I had a, uh, a concussion. I, I fell on the floor. I woke up, like I fainted. I woke up and I remember the, the hospital uh, had sent uh, their, their ambulance and also fire people showed up. And my circulation was getting shut off. I couldn't feel my arms. I couldn't feel my legs. They're worried that I'm having a heart attack. And I remember going through this in my head as I'm explaining what's going on. They asked me if I was okay. And I said, I feel okay. 
but then I, I can't feel my arm, I can't feel my, my right arm, I can't feel my legs, I can't feel, and, and most people would be kind of freaking out at this point. Like, oh my God, I can't feel my arm, I can't feel my legs. <laughs> and I'm calmly explaining that, oh, I can't feel my left hand right now, I can't feel my right hand right now, and just walking them through what's going on. And in my head, this is why it's so important, whether this is actually true or not, in my head, what I'm telling myself is, this is the best, I am the greatest patient of all time. As people are normally freaking out in this moment, I'm calm, I'm explaining what's going on, I'm, I'm amazing, right? And I would never say that stuff out loud, but that's what the voice is inside my head, that this is the best, this is me, I'm amazing, let's go, let's solve this problem. And what it does is, when you're in that negative situation, it switches you to a place of possibility. If you are stuck in complaining and why everything is so bad and why is this happening to me, all you're doing is perpetuating the negative situation. You're not actually solving anything. When you can flip it to say, this is the best. This is my chance to learn, to grow, to improve, to solve this, to show myself what I'm capable of. What it does is it puts you in a place of resourcefulness. It takes you from a place of helplessness into one of resourcefulness that then allows you to go off and solve the problem. That immediate thing that nobody asked for, that you would never wish upon your worst enemy that's happened to you right now, it gives you the tools to actually come out of it. And so switching your mindset, telling yourself that it's the best when you've got these moments of pain and struggle and suffering where you just wanna blame the world and complain and, and tell everybody how negative it is, you flip it. It's the best. Practice those three words. Maybe you're facing that situation right now. Maybe you're dealing with something you hate right now or something, if, if it's not right now, listen, I promise you something is coming. <laughs> At some point that negativity is coming for you. And so use that as inspiration. It's the best. You are where you are because of you, because of the choices you've made. You are right now here stuck where you're stuck. It's not the government's fault. It's not the economy's fault. It's not the algorithm's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's not even your fault. I'm not even here talking about placing blame. It's not about who we're going to blame. It's about taking the responsibility to fix it, to say, I don't want to stay stuck here where I am right now. Things have to change. This is not, this is not my final destination. I'm going places. <laughs> You're going places and taking the responsibility to make that change happen where too many people just get stuck up on the blame. Like, well, I'm here because, well, because of the economy or because of the president or because my parents or because my education or because whatever circumstances. And we use that as a valid excuse, a reason for why we won't take action. Well, it's not your fault. And because it's not your fault, we have somebody to blame. And so that means we can just stay stuck. And unfortunately, that's where most people are stuck. They're stuck being stuck. <laughs> They're stuck placing blame. They're stuck because it's easy, because it's easier to just shut up the world and go dive into Netflix and entertain yourself as opposed to actually fixing the problem. When there are problems that show up in life, and that's gonna happen for everybody, the most common responses people have are one, to blame somebody else, because it's not your fault, and two, to go dive into entertainment as opposed to saying, I don't even care whose fault it is, but I'm gonna take responsibility for where I'm at and I'm gonna invest in myself to flip from entertainment to education so that changes can start to happen. Because until you break that loop, until you break that cycle, you stay stuck and, and it, it's comfortable. It's comfortable and it, and it feels good to know that it's not our fault, but ultimately you're not happy. The short term you're happy because you can just put the blame on somebody else, but long-term, you're not happy. You're not happy because you never get the growth, you never get the progress, you never get your goals, you never accomplish your dreams, and you're, you're stuck there knowing that you're capable of more. I went through this very recently on my YouTube channel. So um, one of the strategies that I've been helping some of my friends with, there's one guy in particular who has blown up, blown up on YouTube, thanks to one key strategy that I gave him. And I told this to him maybe a year and a half ago, and he started applying it maybe six months ago and you see channel popping off. Growing faster than I'm growing <laughs> off of my strategy. And 
I finally came to the realization like, why am I not doing this for my own channels? I'm telling other people to do it. Most people never take action, but this guy actually took action on it. And he's he's crushing me now doing this stuff. Why are we not listening to our own advice? Like, why am I not doing the same thing on my channel yet? And it came down to, well, I'm worried about, I'm worried about my team. I'm worried about how much extra work it is. I'm worried about, um, you know, mostly about my team and like how we've done things in the past and changing things up. And I finally came to the realization that no things, this has to change because if it, if, if I can't make this work, then it's my fault. This is my fault. And my team's livelihood is my responsibility. And I need to be constantly growing and getting better. And if YouTube's algorithm changes, I need to be on top of it. And I, I need to be guiding my team in the right direction because they rely on me for their career and for their impact. Now, could they go get another job? Of course, but hopefully they like working with me <laughs> and the work that we're doing and feel like they're, they're valued and, and what they're creating is having an impact. And so me being afraid is not a good enough reason. And so it wasn't until I really owned that to say, this is, you know, this maybe took a couple months for me for really to sink in. Like my own advice is being used for somebody to help them blow up and we're not doing it because I'm afraid of the impact that it's gonna have on my team. And that can't be a good enough reason. That can't be a good enough reason because ultimately I'm doing a disservice to my team. I'm doing a disservice to myself and I'm doing a disservice to you. Because the more people who can see these videos, the more, the more belief we spread in the world, the more impact we have, the more people's lives change, the more great companies are built. This is my mission. And so if I don't do it, then it's my fault. It's not YouTube for changing. It's not, it's not anybody on my team for resisting. It's me. It's my fault. And so when, when I finally accepted that, then you can move fast. Then I messaged some of the key people on my team said, okay, here's, here's what we need to start to do. And I understand there are problems with this. So let's, let's fix the problems because this has to happen. And now we're doing it and now we're moving quickly and, and you know, hopefully we'll start to see the results. Uh, but it wasn't until I accepted the responsibility for it to say, I'm not going to stay stuck in this rut that we're in that things start to change. Humans are built to serve. It's in my new book, Built to Serve. If you're not happy, it's because you're not serving, either serving the world or serving the, the closest people to you. But if you're not happy, it's because you're not serving. And so I wanna help other people who are struggling with belief, like I was and still do, believe in themselves more. And me playing small and not doing videos and not speaking on stage doesn't serve anybody. It's selfish. It's selfish for me not to get up and do it. So mm -hmm. every time I get on a camera before I do interviews or when I do stage work or when I'm making my videos, even though I've done 6,000 videos for my YouTube channel, wow. I still get a little nervous inside before making the videos because my biggest fear is disappointing people. My biggest fear is I'm gonna show up and not bring value and people are gonna be disappointed in what I made. But that's not a good enough reason. I'm here to serve and so is everybody else. And being afraid is not a good enough reason not to act. When you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you say? When you think about yourself, what do you say? A lot of a lot of the stuff that we say about ourselves, we wouldn't we wouldn't say to our worst enemies. It's rough. I actually think it's great to be your own worst critic. I think it's great. I think honestly, I think for a lot of people, um, we're not hard enough on ourselves. Let me let me stick with me for a minute. We're not hard enough on ourselves because in order to get to where you want to go, you actually need to push yourself more. The problem is why we can't do it is we don't love ourselves enough. We're not our biggest cheerleader enough. You have to balance those two things. We are very hard on ourselves, but because there's no self love, we're not cheering ourselves on enough. We're not our biggest cheerleader. You can't handle it. Most people are already at the breaking point, you know, like I'm sitting here in a parking lot. These, you know, those, I guess it's kind of blurry. You can't really see them, but people hate their lives. They're barely hanging on. Most people are barely hanging on. We're barely hanging on to what we're doing. We we can post all these great things on Instagram or wherever and make it look like we're enjoying our life, but most people are barely hanging on. The people who are judging you for your life and telling you that you suck hate their own lives. They are barely hanging on. So how do we get through it? Well, yes, we can be harder on ourselves, but we need to balance that with more self-love. You have to remind yourself of why you're great, what you're proud of, what you're grateful for. And it has to be consistent. 
Otherwise, you'll never get to where you want to go. And when you love yourself more, that actually allows you to be harder on yourself. When you love yourself more and you actually feel it, you can push yourself harder. You can, you can be more um, demanding of yourself because it's not going to push you over the edge because you're not tying your self-worth to you accomplishing that thing. And when you don't accomplish it, you feel like a loser. It's starting from a place of I'm amazing that allows you to be way harder on yourself. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want to watch Brendan Burchard's top 10 rules of success, check out the video next to me. I think you're going to enjoy. Continue to believe. I will see you there. But high performance requires deliberate habits. A deliberate habit means you kind of have to force yourself to do it. It's not easy. It's not automatic. It's not tiny. It's like going the extra mile thing. It's the tough work of life to go to another level. You want to be at the top.